Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Today I'm doing a side-by-side -side comparison between two X99 motherboards from ASUS. Why should you watch this video? Why should you care? If you are planning on building a high-end enthusiast desktop using either Haswell E or Broadwell E, such as the new i7-6800K 6-core high-end processor, then you've come to the right video. Now, I have previously reviewed this motherboard, the X99-A from ASUS. Link to that in the description below. Today, I'm going to be looking at the differences between it and the brand new X99-A 2 board that's designed to replace it. New features, new updates, but also a new higher price. You can currently find, at least when I film this video, the X99-A board for about $200. The X99-A2 board is $250. Is it worth the extra $50? Let's find out. Now, this is not designed to be an exhaustive review of either board. This is the differences and what you get for switching between the boards. The complete review has already been posted of this link uh, in the description below. The, the complete review of this with unboxing and overview of every component will be done in the future, and if you've not subscribed to my channel, please do so by clicking the big red subscribe button right below this video. To subscribe, you'll get a notification of when that posts. It won't be too long before I get that done. Now, talking about the differences between these two boards. First of all, if you are getting a Haswell E chip, then it doesn't matter which board you get because they both support it directly out of the box. If you're getting Broadwell E, some of the older stock of the X99-A won't support Broadwell E out of the box without a BIOS update. Wait a minute, how are you supposed to update the BIOS if the motherboard doesn't support your chip and you go to put Broadwell E into X99 and it doesn't want to take it? No problem, ASUS has a solution for you. It's called USB BIOS flashback. There is a special port on the back uh, a special USB port that you'll plug a USB uh, thumb drive into, and there's a button on the back called USB BIOS Flashback. You'll put that in with the BIOS downloaded from ASUS's website. They are assuming you own another computer with which to do this. The odds you are you're not building this and it's your first computer ever and you have no access to a computer. You'll have to use another computer, download the updated BIOS from ASUS's website using a USB thumb drive, plug it into the USB port on the back of this, plug it in, turn the power on, press the button on the back of the motherboard, and it will update the BIOS without needing to support your processor. When it's done, you can install your chip and you're good to go. Note, newer revisions of this board that come with the updated BIOS don't need that procedure. They'll work out of the box. It just depends on whether you get a brand new manufactured board or if yours was made more than a few months ago and has been sitting in Amazon or Newegg's warehouse for a while. X99-A2 is guaranteed to come out of the box with Broadwell E support because that's what it was released for. So you have no worries about that. Beyond that issue, both boards will support Broadwell E, both boards will support Haswell E, all the chips in both variations, no problem. What other things have been changed? Well, X99-A supports Turbo Boost 2.0. X99-A2 supports Turbo Boost 3.0. Does this matter? I actually don't think it does. Here's why. Turbo Boost is designed to boost your processor up above its base level design frequency, which in the case of the i7-6800K 60, uh, is 3.4 gigahertz, to some higher number, 3.6, 3.7, whatever. But if you're buying this platform, you shouldn't be running at the default speed of the processor. If you are, then something was missed along the way because you should be overclocking this. This is meant to and designed to be overclocked. And if you're buying this without overclocking it, then something was missed because you should be. You should comfortably be able to run this processor at between 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz with adequate cooling on either of these boards. Now, there's something called the silicon lottery you might get a better chip or a worse chip. Each chip will overclock to a different number. They guarantee it'll run at a certain number. Everything beyond that is a bonus. But in general, between 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz is reasonable with good cooling, either high-end air cooling or excellent liquid cooling. I myself am gonna be installing a Corsair H115i 280 millimeter liquid cooler on this chip, and that should give me all the cooling in the world in order to get lots and lots of overclock out of it. Now, 
I said Turbo Boost isn't a big deal. I had to say all that to explain. If you overclock the chip to the max it will run at anyway, Turbo Boost can do nothing for you. If you overclock this chip to 4.4 gigahertz and that's all it will run at, Turbo Boost can't make it run at 4.6. It's not gonna make it run any faster. So you're not even gonna use Turbo Boost. In fact, frankly, you might even turn Turbo Boost off if you're already running at a max overclock anyway, just so it doesn't interfere or cause you any problems. Now, what other differences are there? USB ports. Both motherboards have the same number of USB 2 and USB 3 ports. USB 3.1, the 10 gigabit super speed ports, is the only place there's a difference, and it's a small one. They both have USB 3.1 ports, and they both have two of them. The difference is X99-A has two USB 3.1 Type A ports. What's a Type A port? It's the one you've used for 15 years. It's the rectangle plug that you've probably way too many times inserted in the wrong direction and you had to turn it over because it only goes in one way. We've been using those for a very long time. X99-A2 has one Type A port and one Type C port. What's a Type C port? The Type C port is a new smaller connector that is reversible. It can be inserted either way, it doesn't care. It is smaller and easier to insert without having to worry about what orientation it goes in. It's a new updated standard that we will be using for many years to come. Currently, there aren't a lot of devices that use the Type C port. Most still use Type A. So they both have USB 3.1 ports, they both have two of them. It's just this one has one Type C, one Type A, this one has two Type A's. Minor difference, but it's there so you know about it. Another change, TPU switch. The TPU switch exists on the X99-A and they've gone ahead and removed it from the A2 board. What's the TPU switch? Something very few people probably ever used. It is a rudimentary crude method of overclocking by telling the motherboard, switch it to TPU1 if you're on air cooling or TPU2 if you're on liquid cooling and it would jump up the overclock to preset default values that might or might not work, that aren't stress tested, and frankly is a bad way to overclock. The way you should overclock these boards is to run the five-way optimization software they provide in Windows. It will step up your clock rate and frequency a bit at a time while stress testing your system to make sure it's stable and put load on it. And it will, you maybe will start each chip out at say four gigahertz and then it'll try 4.1 and then 4.2 and then 4.3 and 4.4 and it'll spend a couple of minutes putting the system at full load seeing if it crashes. If it crashes, well, you've reached your limit. Now, the TPU switch doesn't do that. The TPU switch just picks a number and says, I guess this will work. That's a terrible system, don't use it. So the loss of the TPU switch, in my opinion, is no, no loss at all. But I'm making you aware that it is in fact a change. What other differences are there? Sound chip, okay. According to ASUS, there is a difference in the sound chip the, between these two boards. I don't think there is, really. This one is advertised with Crystal Sound 2. This one is advertised with Crystal Sound 3. They're both Realtek AC1150 sound chips with a very minor revision on this one. It's nice, but frankly, if you cared about that level of difference, you're using an external sound breakout box. I, I don't think you could tell the difference. I, I just don't think it's a big deal but they need something to market and advertise to justify their $50 price tag, so Crystal Sound 3, it sounds impressive. LED lighting. X99-A has no LED lighting. Now, maybe you don't care. Maybe you have a closed case. That's fine. There's no lighting on this board at all. X99-A2 has the Aurora RGB LED lighting. That's a branded name from Zeus. Essentially what it means is that you can light up the chipset, you can light up the cover plate um, on this motherboard in many different colors. There's lights on here and you can use their software in Windows. You can set it to a static color. You can pick from millions of different colors. You can set a breathing or load mode where the colors will change based upon your CPU load or temperature. In fact, uh, looking at the back of the box, there's static, breathing, strobing, 
color cycle, music effect, CPU temperature, rainbow, rainbow comet, and flash and dash. So you have loads of lighting features on this board that aren't on the X99-A. Is that worth another $50? That's a personal choice. But if, for example, you're going to put a high-end video card and maybe you decide to put an Asus uh, Strikes or Styrix or however you pronounce it, the Asus video card in that also comes with the RGB lighting, you could coordinate them and make them look good together, I suppose. Knock yourself out. If you have an open case or maybe a big side window and you care about the color coordination, that's a nice feature to have. I'm just making you aware of it if that's important to you. Ports. There is one additional port that they have added to the X99-A2 that is not on the X99-A, and it's called a U2 port. What's a U2 port, you ask? Glad you asked. To explain U2, I have to back up and explain what the M2 slot is. What's an M2 slot? An M2 slot, which I've shown on the individual reviews, rests right down here on the board. It's a place to install a solid state drive into a slot directly on the board that rests against the motherboards instead of plugging in an external serial ATA drive. Nominally, it's used for this, a Samsung 950 Pro or similar drive. This is an NVMe drive, which is different from the older style drives you use that plug into the serial ATA port. This is up to five times faster than standard two and a half inch solid state drives. Wicked fast, 2.5 gigabytes per second read speed, 1.5 gigabyte per second write speed. That's crazy, that's super fast. However, in order to use that, it has to be plugged directly onto the motherboard and laid flat against the board, and of course you only have a place for one of them. But what if, in the future, manufacturers want to make a two and a half inch solid state drive that would fit in a normal drive bay, but could also use the high performance of the M2 slot? Introducing U2. U2 is a port that sits directly next to the serial ATA ports. It looks nothing like them. It's a different plug and a different configuration, but it's right next to the serial ATA ports. No drives that I know of currently use it. It's a standard that's just been released and might be used in the future. We don't know how much, but it may be used in the future. It provides 32 gigabits per second transfer rate between the motherboard and a solid state drive, as opposed to six gigabits per second of serial ATA. Note, you cannot use both the U2 port and the M2 slot on the motherboard at the same time. I'm sure future revisions years from now that will change, they'll reconfigure the chipsets, but for now, it's one or the other. So if you're planning on buying a 950 Pro to insert in this, you cannot also then use the U2 port. But maybe you use a standard solid state drive because they are cheaper, these are a bit expensive. In the future, if a two and a half inch NVMe 2.5 gigabyte per second solid state drive comes out or faster, using the U2 port, you could add it to this board without having to change anything or plug something into the motherboard or mess with it. It's nice to have. Not a make or break feature in my opinion because you may go the whole life of this motherboard and never use it, but I'm making you aware of the differences. There is one other minor difference between these boards and that is official RAM support. The X99-A board has official 64 gigabytes of memory support. The X99-A-A2, it's so hard to say, has 128 gigabyte official support. Let me be clear on official support. If you plug in 128 gigabytes of RAM into the X99-A2 board and it's on Asus's official memory vendor list, on Azusa's website, you can view a list of all the certified memory modules guaranteed to work. Azus will support you. They'll say, well, then there's a problem with your board or there's a problem with your RAM. Let's get this fixed. If you try to do that on the X99-A, Azus will go, well, you're not operating in a supported mode. But note, I have read many reports online from people who have had no trouble plugging 128 gigs of RAM into this board and it works just fine. On certain modules, Maybe, but they won't support you if it don't. I don't think this is a big deal. Why? I don't think a lot of people are plugging 128 gigs into either board. First, 128 gigs is still pretty expensive. 
That may change in the future, but right now that's still a lot of money. Second of all, if you need 100, if you actually need 128 gigabytes of RAM, I suspect you should actually not be on either one of these boards. You should be on Intel's Xenon platform, their workstation server platform. Why? Because the reason to run 128 gigs is you're either running a ton of virtual machines, you have a huge database or you have a huge amount of I.O. going on, you have, you're running a server, or perhaps you're running a massive 3D render of a data set that is just gigantic, in which case you probably shouldn't be on a 6-core chip, you should probably be on a 20-core chip, which is Intel Xenon platform which offers things like ECC error correcting uh, code memory and larger RAM support and more professional oriented features. So if you need more than 32 to 64 gigs of RAM, take a look at Intel Xenon platform. It's not as exp expensive as you think. I've thought about doing a review of it, but it's a little beyond the scope of what I'm doing on my channel. But there are some deals to be found there too if you need that level of performance. As far as differences goes, that's it. And while I used a lot of words to describe the differences, it's not actually that much. Official 128 versus 64, Crystal Sound 3 versus Crystal Sound 2, minor difference. Turbo Boost 3 versus Turbo Boost 2, minor difference. I don't think it matters. RGB, LED lighting, no lighting. Now, well, okay, if that's important to you, that's fine. That, that is not a, I can't review that difference. That's just a personal opinion. You like it or you don't, and that's fine. Um, official Broadwell E support out of the box, the potential to have to do a BIOS flash before you install your processor. It's not hard to do, but it's an extra step. At the time I filmed this video, $250, $200. Note, if you're watching this video in the future, these prices may converge at some point. They may get closer. At $50 difference, I could make an argument for still buying the older board if you don't care about the, the, the extra features because you're saving $50 you can put into your solid state drive or into RAM or a video card. I mean, it's, you know, it's money. Now, that being said, if when you watch this video, these boards are $20 to $30 apart, yeah, buy the X99-A2. At some point, they may converge, and this whole comparison may be pointless. They may even stop making the older board. They're currently still for sale directly from Newegg and Amazon. They still have both of them in stock. Thus, I'm making this video. I hope it's useful to you as a comparison between these two boards. As I said before, I will be doing a follow-up individual review of the X99-A2. Remember to subscribe if you have not already done so to get a notification of when that comes out. And speaking of which, if you like this video, click like. If you don't, don't. Subscribe. Comments, questions, thoughts, feedback, and suggestions go below the video description below. And speaking of the video description, if you like my videos, if you found this comparison helpful and useful, if you find my channel helpful and useful in general, check out all the links in my video description below. They will support me, and that is how you can get me to keep making videos like this for you. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it, and I will see you next time.